On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian Chi, Mr. Curtis Franklin back on the show. Now, do you have sites and services that use analytic libraries? Well, they may be collecting more data than you think. We'll talk about it. The DDoS attacks are on the rise. Today, we have Steve Winterfeld. He's advisory CISO of Akamai. And we're going to discuss the current state of things and just how you can protect your organization. You definitely shouldn't miss it. Twilight on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 531, recorded February 17th, 2023. How, Akamai, are you about DDoS? This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Cisco, orchestrated by the experts at CTW. When you need to get more out of your technology, Cisco makes hybrid work possible. CDW makes it powerful. Learn more at cdw.com slash Cisco. And by Thanks Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to canary.tools slash twit. Enter the code twit in the how to hear about us box. And by ACI Learning. Tech is one industry where opportunities outpace growth, especially in cybersecurity. One third of information security jobs require a cybersecurity certification. To maintain your competitive edge across audit, IT, and cybersecurity readiness, visit go.acilearning.com. Um, slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm Louis Moreska, your host, your guide through this big world of the enterprise, but I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts, so I have your own senior analyst at Amdia. He is Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, it's great to see you, my friend. How's your week been? It has been a good week, Lou. It's uh, been one filled with some research. I've got some projects starting up. Um, been watching my colleagues publish an awful lot. Uh, and it is amazing how full our dance cards are getting for the RSE conference. Uh, RSA is coming up. Um, and I'm just trying to keep my meeting count down to double digits per day. If I can do that, I'm going to call it a successful conference. And do you act like the, the uh, airlines you double book just in case? Uh, I wish. Um, it uh, is the sort of thing where the, the hard part is actually keeping plenty of time between meetings uh, because it is astounding how often you'll get companies that say, Oh, well, we're not in the convention center, but we're in a hotel that's very close. Uh, very close is one of those terms that varies in meaning depending on exactly who you're talking to. Right. So uh, I'll definitely have my hiking boots on when I'm at RSA. Indeed. Well, it's great to have you here, Curtis. Thanks for being here. Well, we also have to welcome back our very own NEC architect at Sky Fiber, and he's our favorite network guy. He is Mr. Brian G. Chebert. How's everything going on your side? How's the uh, the fairgrounds treating you? We're having a lot of fun. <clears throat> We're um, running a whole bunch of cable trying to get ready. The fair, the loadout for the fair actually starts this next weekend. And so lots and lots of rides, all kinds of things. It's, it's a, like any big state fair for a large city. Um, but this is not going to be one of the first times I'm doing it from the IT side trying to uh, get a bunch of security cameras up and make sure we can kind of keep an eye on what's going on with the folks enjoying the Central Florida Fair. Well, thanks, Chibert, for being here. We appreciate it. Well, we should get started because we have a lot to talk about here. And if you have sites and services, do you have analytic libraries? Do you use them? Well, they might be collecting more data than you think. We'll talk about some scenarios where that's not so good. DDoS attacks are on the rise. Say we have Steve Winterfeld. He's advisory CS CISO, advisory CISO of Akamai. And we're going to talk about and just discuss the current state of things and just how you can protect yourself. So stick around. Lots more to discuss. But before we do, let's go ahead and jump to this week's news blips. We can't have an enterprise week 
without a leak. According to this Ars Technica article, health information for 1 million patients was stolen using a critical Go Anywhere vulnerability. First, let's talk about what Go Anywhere actually is. It's a managed file transfer service. It's supposed to actually help organizations securely exchange data between their systems and trading partners and customers. Now, in their very definition of their service, it claims to be secure. Well, one of the biggest hospital chains in the U.S. said hackers obtained health information from 1 million patients after exploiting a vulnerability in Go Anywhere. Community Health Health Systems of Franklin, Tennessee, said in a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission this week that they were attacked and the hackers targeted Go Anywhere. Surprisingly, two weeks ago, journalist Brian Krebs said on social media that Cybersecurity firm Forda had issued a private advisory to customers warning that the company had recently learned of a zero-day remote code execution ex- exploit in and actually targeted Go Anywhere. Now, the vulnerability has since gained the designation CVE-2023-0669, and Forda patched the vulnerability on February 7th. So the attack vector of this exploit requires access to the administrator console of the application, which in most cases is only accessible from within a private company network through VPN or by an allowed list IP address. In the case of CHS, the malware used in the attack was an updated version of a family known as TrueBot, which is used by a threat group known as Silence. Now, Silence, in turn, has ties to a group tracked as TA505, and TA505 has ties to a ransomware group called CLOP. Now, the type of attack that can get access is formally called a pre-authentication deserialization issue with a very high rating for an exploit and attacker value. Now, to exploit the vulnerability, attackers need to either network level access to go anywhere's MFT's administration portal or the ability to target an internal user's browser. Now, first, what they do and what like what we always say on this organ- on this uh, show is the most effective way to help prevent something like this, especially this type of attack, is patching, right? Because they have a patch, they it's up, it's available to update. Definitely go patch your services and update right away. When it's your organization and you're dealing with health data, that should be your prize zero going forward. Always patch things. Now, another thing you can do is ensure that network level access to the administrator port is restricted to the least number of users possible and remove user browser access to the vulnerable endpoint in the web.xml file. In fact, maybe even wall garden the entire system going forward. Well, just in case you still don't believe that malware is the constant battle of wits and technology between attackers and defenders, I give you this. One week after CISA released a recovery script for ransomware targeting VMware ESXi virtual machines, a modified version of the malware is already in circulation that renders the decryptor script useless. According to CISA and the FBI, around 3,800 servers across the globe have already fallen victim to the ransomware, which is known as EXSI ARGS. Researchers at Malwarebytes say that previous versions of the malware would skip large blocks of storage in its encryption run, encrypting smaller files and encrypting enough of the larger files to make it effective. The new variant only skips small blocks of storage in these big files, typically one meg on, one meg off pattern. Files smaller than 128 megs, well, they're still fully encrypted. Well, with all this, how can you tell if you're hit, whether you've been hit with the older version of EXSIRGs that does have a decryptor script or the newer version that leaves you really vulnerable? Well, if the ransomware note directs you to contact the threat actor via the TOX encrypted messenger, uh, you've been hit by the latest and, well, not exactly greatest version. If the ransom note from uh, directs you to a Bitcoin address, well, that means that you're lucky enough to have the old ESXi ARGS variant encrypting your files and there still could be hope. All right. So this was one of those great stories about how, you know, journalism got involved and helped out someone. Well, Matthew Hillier um, can't get Comcast service at his home in Arvada, Colorado, 
But that didn't stop Comcast from claiming it serves its house when it submitted data to the Federal Communications Commission's new broadband map. Well, Comcast eventually admitted to the FCC that it didn't serve the address, but only after Ars Technica got involved. And thank you, Ars Technica, for this great story. Comcast will have to correct its submission for Hillier's house, and a bigger correction might be needed because it appears Comcast doesn't serve dozens of other nearby homes that it claimed as part of its coverage area. Well, okay, so I've actually helped other friends on this particular issue and have gotten varied excuses like, oh, the GPS accuracy varies and that caused your friend to be listed when it actually, when in actuality you can't offer a service at their location. Hmm. Another interesting thing I learned as my partner and I were firing up a wireless internet service provider in Honolulu was that the big players won't even consider running fiber to a building or neighborhood unless a minimum of 40 potential customers exist in that location. So we did what makes sense. We target our market at those underserved two and three story walk-ups in the greater Honolulu area. Well, this, however, doesn't excuse Comcast from padding their coverage numbers. Rumor has it that the folks that created those coverage maps sometimes rock and roll and add entire neighborhoods because they're right next to the neighborhood that is covered. So instead of actually confirming those addresses, perhaps someone took a liberty. So no one's been willing to step up and confirm any of these rumors. And I stress these are rumors. I don't have any proof. Um, so that's all they are, rumors. However, as more and more of these types of cases arise, one must wonder, who's taking those shortcuts? We have another breach to share this week. Now, according to this TechCrunch article, Alassian and Envoy are at each other's throat trying to point the finger blame on their most recent breach. A hack group known as Siege Sack leaked data on Telegram this week that it claimed it had stolen from Alassian. Now, this data includes the names, email addresses, work departments, and phone numbers of approximately 13,200 Atlassian employees, along with floor plans of Atlassian headquarters. Now, Atlassian was quick to point the finger of the blame for the breach at Envoy, which the Sydney headquartered company uses to actually organize its office spaces. Now, in a statement from Atlassian, they quote, learned that data from Envoy, a third-party app that Atlassian uses to coordinate in office resources, was compromised and published. However, no Atlassian customer data was exposed. Now, here's the interesting part. Envoy fired back with claims that there's no security compromises on their system at all, and that forced Atlassian to actually change their tune a bit, seeing that the data was retrieved from Envoy using an Atlassian's employees' credentials that were published in a public repository. Whoops. Now, they found evidence in the logs of the request that confirms that hackers obtained valid user credentials from an Atlassian employee account and used the access to download the effective data from Envoy's app. Now, Envoy is no stranger to security issues. In 2019, researchers found ways to actually expose customer data. Now, it goes to show you that if you entrust into third-party systems, and those services really require you to do a thorough audit and just how they secure and treat your data going forward and you know how they integrate into your business. Take the time. You won't spend an extra dime. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that's Cisco, orchestrated by the experts at CDW. The helpful people at CDW understand that hybrid work continues to evolve and that your organization must evolve with it to succeed. Now, with so many options to collaborate remotely, you need a strong and consistent network to empower your workforce and keep them together. Consider a Cisco hybrid work solution designed and managed by the CDW experts now, to deliver the same quality, the network experience to all your offices, even your satellite ones connecting your team from pretty much anywhere because Cisco networking keeps things flowing smoothly and securely with embedded security, compliance, and multi-factor authentication that protects collaboration among your spread out team. Now with real-time visibility into distributed application, security, user, and service performance, you get a better line of sight into how your network is operating and how better to grow your organization. And Cisco networking levels the playing field, providing access to flexible, high-end collaborative experiences that create an inclusive work environment. When you need to get more out of your technology, Cisco makes hybrid work possible 
CDW makes it powerful. Learn more at cdw.com slash Cisco. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, HIPAA is that privacy act that attempts to keep corporations in line when it comes to your patient health and personal information. You kind of want to trust it, right? Well, this dark reading article takes us to the dark side of things and how parent company Facebook Meta might be encouraging corporations to actually violate. That's right. In this example, a hospital was actually sued for using Meta's ad tracking code violating HIPAA. Now, as a brief reminder, HIPAA really requires that a patient health information be secure and confidential, and it can be only used or disclosed for certain purposes. Now, this includes any information that may be used for identifying the individual, such as their name, address, or even their birth date. Now, according to this lawsuit, two hospitals were hauled to court and that they were using Meta Pixel ad tracking code, which shared sensitive medical information and data with Facebook. Now, the key here is sensitive medical info, which actually violates HIPAA in this case. And you may be wondering what kind of information did they share, right? Well, according to the suit, the data they collected for it, and these two hospitals were sharing medical conditions, prescriptions, doctor's names, prior appointment history, so the patients could be targeted for advertising, according to the lawsuit firm, and behind the action here. Now, what people would use when, when people actually use health system websites to schedule an appointment, the code allegedly captured sensitive personal information, such as medical conditions, those prescriptions, and those doctor's names. Now, the firm says in one case, for example, a woman got targeted ads about heart disease and joint pain just after entering her info into one of the hospital's websites. Now, before I read this article, I thought, mm, maybe they just released PII that they were maybe sharing or something like that. But how could they think that they would get away with sharing medical history is really beyond me here. Now, I can't get even some of my doctors to disclose what they're calling me about without providing proof of identification. So another interesting thing that goes along here, this past December, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services actually issued guidance on using online tracking tools and healthcare customer relationship management systems. Now, the, that, they actually addressed online tracking technologies like Google Analytics or Meta, Meta Pixel, which, which actually collect and analyze information on how internet users are interacting with those regulatory websites. Now, what comes to health systems, using any type of tracking system outside the bounds of itself is a no-no. The only reason for it to be useful is for profit for that healthcare provider. So blocking it should be possible. Now, obviously, this isn't the first time Meta has been held accountable for collecting detailed information like this. Meta actually was been fined 390 million euros uh, just recently by European Union regulators in a major decision, a violation of EU's general data protection regulation. So this is a very interesting case of, well, should the organizations even be using this type of analytics? Uh, library. I'm going to bring my co-host back in because, you know, obviously HIPAA is one of those things. It's 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 pretty easy to understand. Don't share any information. Is this a case where these organizations were just using it because they needed to know about their traffic on their site and they just didn't really know what data was getting funneled somewhere, or is it just benign in nature? Or what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm I'm going to speculate. You know, when I saw. A bunch of things happening at the university's um, website. I saw the developers throwing in the templates for the ad trackers and so forth because they wanted to maximize things. They threw it way up as part of the, the template for the entire website without thinking how far that reaches. So we, we actually went in and said, uh, excuse me, are we really supposed to be tracking all this stuff? And um, in our case, we caught it before the website went live. Um, but in our test cases, some test SSNs made it into the system. It's like, no, 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 that's bad. That's a big FERPA violation. Um, so I can see this happening, especially when you've got a development team developing a system and they're understaffed and rushed. So I call this the rock and roll factor. You know, just throw it up as high as you can, make it as global as you can so that we can get in and get to the meat of the problem. And sometimes it goes too far. Agreed, agreed. Well, 
Lou, I, I think that this is a great way to discuss the difference between privacy and security. You know, we often think that privacy violations only happen when there's some sort of breach of the system. Uh, you know, guys in dark hoodies are breaking in and stealing private information to sell on the black market. That didn't happen here. I am sure that the patient's information was transmitted very securely to people who should never have been seeing it. It was not a security violation, but it was a massive privacy violation. This, the weird thing is I know when I was, for example, um, working on a grant proposal around a hospital at the University of Florida, I was never anywhere near patient information. But because I was working with the hospital, I had to go through HIPAA training. I somewhere in my file still have uh, a HIPAA certificate suitable for framing. Everyone who works in and around health organizations should have training on what HIPAA means and what it means to their job. The fact that someone thought that advertising dollars overweighed the consideration of patient privacy means that there was a dramatic management breakdown at this organization. And, you know, it's not simple. If you're not a health care provider, and that means hands-on health care provider, or you, you're not an insurance company paying them, you don't need any personal health information unless that patient has given you explicit written permission to have it. And we know that not everyone who went to that website gave that explicit written permission. So this is just a horrible story, and I can only hope that it will be a true cautionary tale for other IT professionals working in healthcare. That's a great point. I, I, I do want to point out, I mean, a lot of organizations, and I think it goes back to something that Chibert said, is a lot of organizations should be taking um, catalog of the libraries that they're depending on. And those that are, of course, bundled with their dependencies as they deploy their services. And so this type of thing should be reviewed on a regular basis. It should be reviewed by security people. It should be reviewed in compliance uh, scenarios. And I think this is a perfect example of these two places not doing that. Um, these are cases where when you're building an application, um, obviously this application is built and it's deployed and there's some kind of uh, you know DevOps related to it. There should be tools in place to let you know when you're doing something that's not compliant. And I think just like uh, Curtis said, you know, there these organizations need to pay attention more to these types of things going forward. You know, uh, Chibert, I want to ask you a quick question. When you, in the case of the university, you know, obviously this is probably maybe a bunch of students building this thing. But in the case of a of a of a maybe health organization like this, this is probably a corporation that maybe they, you know, they paid to actually build. Is shouldn't that they be held accountable for this rather than you know? Well, you know, the, the DevOps professionals are supposed to know what their tools do and the scope of their tools. Right. You know, sometimes, but, you know, I'll go back to the FERPA violation. We, we actually had another one where a professor, they, he posted a spreadsheet, basically, up on a website with the students' grades. Well, that would be fine as long as you, you know, obscure the name, you know, full names and things like that. Bozo put in social security numbers. It's like, no, you had the training, you know about FERPA. He goes and posts it and then heads off to Switzerland uh, for to go back home. It's like, idiot. We actually had to take down the entire website. Um, and it was really only exposed for about two hours. But sometimes you start getting into bozoitis. 
um, <laughs> people that are trained that just didn't engage brain. It happens. Humans are fallible. Um, personally, I think, you know, in this case, this hospital might want to consider a few additional checks and balances, maybe have someone outside of the DevOps team review things before it goes um, public. Um, one of the things I always tried to do was um, pick up someone that literally wasn't technical to review things before we went from draft to um, public. Um, just because sometimes it's hard to see the forest from the trees. Anyway, uh, that's enough of a rant. Um, humans make mistakes. Humans need to do better. And in the case of HIPAA, someone's going to hold their feet to the fire in the future, and they are going to need to do a lot of retraining, I think. In this particular case, I mean, this is a huge lawsuit. You know, this, these, these organizations are going to be hit with a class action suit that's going to probably enforce and force them as a force of function to change all of their policies and their process. I guarantee that. Now, let's just hope if we speculate a little bit, a little bit about this, you know, let's just hope it's not some front end developer that was trying to get the best of those organizations, trying to make some money off of the amount of traffic that was hitting those organizations. Because I can't imagine, I, Curtis, I want to throw this to you because I can't imagine an health organization needing some kind of ad tracking tool? Like, why do you need ads on a health site or service? Well, there are a couple of, of reasons you would need them. One is for your own ads, for your own in-house ads, but that's obviously not what's going on here. Uh, healthcare organizations tend to, let's remember, most of them today are for-profit institutions. And therefore, they would get a commission or a, an actual ad placement payment for every ad they serve. And like most online ads today, it's not based just on how many eyeballs see it, but on what the response rate is. And so they have a financial um, incentive to target those ads as carefully as they can. Um, it all gets back to money. And ultimately, someone somewhere deciding that the money that came in from the advertising could more than pay for any fine that occurred if there was a problem. You know, it's the, the same strain of logic that says that defending against a DDoS attack is more expensive than being hit by a DDoS attack. And they weigh those numbers and the math tends to work really well right up until it doesn't. And then when it doesn't work, it really doesn't work. It's true. It's true. Well, guys, I think we've probably beat that one to death. So let's move on because I definitely want to get to my guests. There's lots of interesting topics we're going to get to here. So we've let's make sure we move on. But before we do that, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this weekend, Enterprise Tech. And that's Things Canary. Now, most companies discover that they've been breached way too late. Now, Things Canary fixes this in just three minutes of set of three minutes. That's it. With, a, with no ongoing overhead and they nearly zero false positives. And you can detect attackers long before they actually dig in. Now, it's no wonder why Things Canary hardware, VM and cloud-based canaries are deployed and loved on all seven continents. Prowling attackers look for juicy content. You know this. They look over your network. They browse Active Directory for file servers and explore file shares looking for documents. They try default passwords against network devices and web services and scan for open services across your network. Now, when they encounter a Things Canary, the services, the services on offer are designed to solicit further investigation. That's right. At which point they actually betray themselves and your Canary notifies you of the incident. Order, configure, and deploy your Canaries throughout your network. These can be hardware or virtual or cloud-based birds. Make, uh, make them Windows file servers. Maybe make them another router. Throw in a few Linux web servers while you're at it. Each one hosts realistic services and looks exactly and acts the same way as its namesakes. Now when, then when you actually sit back and you wait, your Things Canaries run silently in the background waiting for intruders, constantly reporting in and providing an up-to-minute report on their status. Even customers with hundreds of canaries receive just a handful of events per year. 
When an incident occurs, Things Canaries will alert you via email, text message, Slack notification, webhook, or the old-fashioned syslog way. Now, a principal security engineer of, of an F50 company says, quote, Canary has helped us detect and mitigate several incidents that could have turned into catastrophes. An alert fired by their cloned site token allowed us to identify and force a takedown of several doppelganger domains that were purchased by bad actors for the purpose of launching phishing attacks against our employees and customers. I can't recommend this product enough. You don't know what you don't know, but Canary helps you know what you need to know when it matters. You may have heard about Circle CI compromise recently. Well, most users found out about the incident directly from their things Canary. Canary's work and continually prove it. Visit canary.tools slash twit. And for just $7,500 per year, you'll get five Canaries, your own hosted console upgrade support and maintenance. And if you use code TWIT and they had to hear about this box, you'll get 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love your Things Canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your Canaries with their two-month money-back guarantee for a full refund. And all the years we've offered a money-back refund guarantee, it's been claimed zero times as Canaries add incomparable value. That's canary.tools slash twit. Enter the code twit in the how to hear about us box. And we thank Things Canary for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twiat Riot. Today we have Steve Winterfeld. He's advisory CISO of Akamai. Welcome to the show, Steve. Excited to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, our audience is from all different experience levels and all different points in their career. Some of them love to hear people's origin stories. Can you take us through a journey through tech and what brought you to Akamai? Certainly. So, you know, I um, I was actually in adjacent many, many years ago, uh, was running battle simulation software for the military and uh, had a chance to follow my passion with, you know, security, uh, was a hobbyist. Uh, moved over and uh, started to build a, the first computer emergency response team for Southcom. Uh, so got to jump in right in on the response side. Uh, and and for people that are thinking about this, you know, you can come in and follow the analytics side. You can follow the compliance side. You can build and and develop. There are a lot of skills we need here. And for those of you that are kind of on your journey, I would encourage you to think about your North Star. What do you want your final job to be? So, you know, do you want to be a CISO for a Fortune 500, the CTO for a cyber company? Think about that now and use that to guide your skills. If you're in cyber and you don't love to learn, you're probably in the wrong field. Indeed, indeed. That's good good advice. I like that a lot. Now, we have, we have a ton to talk about here, especially the concept around DDoS attacks. Now, we hear a lot about in the news the uptick of ransomware. We hear a lot of you know uptick of, of organizations being hit by this, and they're focusing on that. We don't hear necessarily a lot about the change or the if, if organizations are being hit by DDoS attacks. Is this just because they're handling it, they're, they're, they're doing fine? What's, what's the current state of things when it comes to that type of attack? So really, the business model from the criminal's point of view is an extortion campaign you know, pay us to not attack you. Uh, and so, you know, you'll, you'll get a short attack followed by a, a ransom or an extortion demand to, to not attack you more. Um, you were talking about healthcare earlier. Last week, we saw a rash of healthcare organizations attacked by KillNet. Uh, every year, we see new records broken. Um, earlier this year, we saw Google Public Cloud come out with, you know, a $46 million or 46 million hits. Uh, Cloudflare just talked about 71 million. Uh, Mariah Bot last year was uh, 2.5 terabits. Um, and so I want to step back for just a second and geek out a little bit about what those mean. So when you hear about an attack and you hear, Request per second, that's somebody attacking a web page. If you hear them bits per second, they're trying to clog the pipeline, just overwhelm you with data. If you hear packets per second, they're trying to, to attack the CPU and overwhelm the processor. 
And finally, if you hear queries per second, they're trying to take down the DNS, you know, wipe out the phone book or the GPS of the internet. And so there are different ways or different aspects of what we're being attacked. And so you have to say, am I at layer three, four protecting? Am I at layer seven protecting? Am I protecting my DNS? And then when these hit these attacks, okay, that's a big number, but, but let's say, okay, what really happened? So we'll go to the Google Cloud uh, attack. So for 69 minutes, there was this, this long attack. But then, you know, during it, all of a sudden, in about 10 seconds, it peaked from normal attack to a record-setting attack. And that lasted for just a few minutes. And what was the impact? Low impact. A lot of these we're hearing about huge numbers, but they were behind good infrastructure. So the impact was, you know, mitigated a lot. Now, it's interesting you said this because the Google Public Cloud, you know, they have obviously their major DNS services that tend to get hit with this a lot. What is the advantage here? Like, what are what are what are what are hackers doing when they're actually doing DDoS attacks? What are they? What are their major their main focus here when they're doing this? Is it is it smoke and mirrors? Is it trying to basically do something over here where they do something over here? What 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 what's the main the main thing that they're trying to achieve essentially? So if I'm if I'm a criminal, I can sell denial of service uh, as a service. Uh, one of the most attacked industries. So we'll talk about the top three most attacked industries. Uh, do you want to guess what number one is? Ransomware? It's actually against gaming. Gaming is the number one industry attacked, oh, followed by financial services, followed by high tech. So when you think about who's being attacked, gaming is, you know, those booter services. Um, so, you know, if it's attacking a hospital, that's kind of extortion, preventing you from, you know, saving lives. Uh, and that's kind of the kill net. So the, the kill net is hackivist. So they're not necessarily financially motivated. They're tied into Russia and they have a political agenda. So countries supporting uh, Ukraine, then they're going to go against them. There are others that are, like I said, you know, um, let's say you're a gambling site and just before a major game like the Super Bowl, if I knock your site off, you're going to lose all your revenue. So pay me 25 Bitcoins not to do a DDoS attack against you. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I, I've actually seen some scenarios where organizations were giving away something free. Like you had to go sign up for an account and they gave you a free, you know, uh, I don't know, piece of software or whatnot for a temporarily use for DevOps scenarios. And I've seen scenarios where, you know, they'll go and create some kind of botnet that DDoS attacks their service to kind of like have them go focus on that while they go and create a bunch of, you know, nefarious accounts in this kind of free, free phases. And then they, you know, they stop their DDoS attack and they now have all these nefarious accounts that weren't being watched because as the organization went and focused on the DDoS attack. So it seems to me that sometimes the attack itself is a direct, um, you know, essentially directed at a particular service to take it down. In this case, like you said, to, to gain some capital on it. But in some cases, it's, hey, I'm going to do it over here to, to make you, you know, spend a bunch of time trying to stop it while we go do something over here. Do you think that, is there a specific trend that you're seeing when it comes to those types? Is it all types that you're seeing kind of trending or is it particularly ones that are focused on making money? So um, I will say there's, there's two kind of attacks that are adjacent attacks. The one is attack as a distraction which is what you were talking about. The other is attack to overwhelm my logs. So if if you just overwrite my security logs because I have so much DDoS information, that makes it really hard for me to do an investigation as well. So I've seen both of those methods used on the, on the aggressor side. Um, we have a, a really a broad blend here. Like I said, we have the hackivist with one motivation and they're having a big impact going after hospitals, going after airports. Um, you have others that are almost proof of concepts where you see a large attack, but there was no extortion. Um, we see a number that we think are part of an integrated attack. And, and now that this is, you can go rent this as a service, 
I think that offers even more business models as the criminals try to go out there. So more complexity, uh, bigger attacks, and more diversity and purpose. So, you know, as we see, obviously, as, as a service is creating a big problem, because now it's making it, it's bringing kind of that down the barrier of entry down to much lower layer. Um, so people can just go go and pay somebody to go and do what they need to do. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, as we see more and more organizations get hit by this, some of them believe that all they need to do is make sure that they can scale really well, that their service is elastic and they won't have be hit that hard by a DDoS attack. Is that a fallacy? Does it does that mean that they they're not really paying attention to the real problem? So I, I guess part of this goes back to your business model. Um, you know, I've seen people that really protect their websites and then they'll get hit with the DDoS on their infrastructure side and now their employees, all their remote workers can't get in. Or they'll really protect their website and their workers, but not their DNS. And so then you take down their DNS. So I think part of this goes back to, you know, looking at your overall security model and where you can accept risk. Um, and ultimately, and this is true just about every security control you have, is your current con security control keeping up with the latest volume metric attack? So then, are your security playbooks designed to go fast enough? We just said it went from a low attack to a record setting attack in 10 seconds. So are you designed to be responsive inside, you know, because if you have elastic bandwidth that takes two minutes, then you're offline for at least two minutes. And if that's an acceptable business model, that's great. Um, and so a lot of this comes back down to getting into the specifics. But really, you got to exercise these. You got to have playbooks, and then you know, so many of us have this matrix security control. Are are is your ISP doing it? Is somebody like Akamai? We provide that service. Are we doing it for you? Is it? Are you using some cloud native capability? Um, and as you do all this, that's a shared relationship. So, you know, if there's a human in the loop. How are you making sure that that goes at at the speed you need to go to? Does that all make sense? Absolutely. Now we we like to talk about the obligatory mid sized business that does have those shared relationships. They maybe attempted themselves at a at a at a security playbook, but they are you know obviously looking for some way to protect themselves from this type of attack, both remote workers as well as access to their services, maybe their web applications. Is there something they should be looking for? You, you mentioned Akamai doing some things here. Is there something that they should be looking for that's definitely helpful? They can go and purchase some service to help here or some kind of uh, software, that kind of thing? So there are certain functions that, you know, as a CSO that I'm like, okay, the things I do every day. So every day I'm fighting a phishing email. So I can keep that in-house. Uh, and, and I've got the skill sets to do for it. There are other things that I don't do that often. Uh, how often do I need a forensic investigator? How often do I need, you know, somebody who can go fight a DDoS attack if I only get a couple of those a year? Um, and so those are areas where I kind of say, where do I want to go to a managed provider and where do I want to keep it, you know, an internal playbook or internal skill set? Um, and, and then finally, where are the skill sets in demand? Things like threat hunters, uh, talent is incredibly hard to get. So do I want to bring in threat hunters? And, and I'm going down a rabbit hole, but you see what I'm talking about here. And so something like DDoS, I tend to think a great opportunity to put it under a managed provider. Uh, you know, and again, there are so many, you know, you're, if you're a small group with an ISP, your ISP probably has some capability. If you're a startup in a cloud environment and you're completely cloud native, and I'm so jealous that you don't have any tech debt and I don't even want to talk to you, but if you're in that kind of an environment, then you know maybe you just go with that cloud native. And, and as you get larger, you start to worry about you know vendor lock-in, but that's a, a different problem for a later day. Right, right. All good suggestions. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in, but before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this weekend enterprise tech, and that's 
ACI Learning. Now, for the last decade, our partners at IT Pro have brought you engaging and entertaining IT training to level up your career or organization. Now, IT Pro is part of ACI Learning. Now, with IT Pro, ACI Learning is expanding its reach and production capabilities, offering you the content and learning mode you need at any stage in your development. Whether you're at the beginning of your career or looking to move up in your sector, ACI Learning is here to support your growth, not only in IT, but cybersecurity and audit readiness. Now, one of the most widely recognized beginner certifications is the CompTIA A plus certification. Now CompTIA courses with IT Pro from ACA Learning make it easy to go from daydreaming about the career in IT to actually launching it. The earning certificates opens doors to most entry level IT positions and supplies potential promotions for those already in the field. Now tech is one industry where opportunities outpace growth, especially in cybersecurity. Now a recent LinkedIn study predicts IT jobs will be the most in-demand roles in 2023, so there's no time to waste. Now, about one-third of information security jobs require a cybersecurity certification, compared to 23% of all IT jobs. Now, while organizations are hungry for cybersecurity talent, the cyber skills gap grows bigger each day. We just talked about that. Now, the average of salary for a cybersecurity specialist is about $116,000. ACI Learning's Information Security Analyst and Cybersecurity Specialist programs can actually help you get certified. Now, in 2022, the global cybersecurity workforce gap increased by 26.2% compared to 2021. Now, I see ACI Learning offers multiple cybersecurity training programs that can prepare you to enter or advance within this exciting industry. Now, the most popular cybersecurity certifications offered are CISSP, EC Council Certified Ethical Hacker, Certified Network Defender, Cybersecurity Audit School, and Cybersecurity Frameworks. Now, where and how you learn really matters. ACA Learning offers fully customizable training for all types of learners, whether preferred in person, on demand, or remote. Take learning beyond the classroom. Explore everything ACA Learning has to offer with IT Pro, Audit Pro, including Enterprise Solutions webinars, and the Skeptical Audit Podcast, Practice Labs, Learning Hubs, and the Partnership Program. Tech is one industry where opportunities outpace growth, especially in cybersecurity. One third of information security jobs require a cybersecurity certification to maintain your competitive edge across audit, IT, and cybersecurity readiness. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. That's go dot acilearning.com slash twit. Don't forget to use our special code twit30 to get 30% off a standard or premium individual IT pro membership. And we thank ACI Learning for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking to Steve Winterfeld. He's the advisory CISO of Akamai. We've talked a lot about DDoS, DDoS attacks here. Now, how have I been saying this wrong? Is it actually DDoS attacks or am I okay saying DDoS? Please, please help I, me. I think most people are saying DDoS. Okay. And <laughs> that kind of goes back to CISO versus CISO. Yeah. It's, okay. I thought for I, years I, I was that saying that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, I do want to bring these guys back in because they are a lot more experienced in, in networking stuff than I am. So, uh, Chuber, I want to throw this to you first. Actually, I want to ask a question that I got hit with by a salesperson trying to sell me a rack or a portion of a rack in one of those new super colos where they have so many pieces of fiber coming in and so many providers that the salesman said, Oh, we might as well have an infinity sign, you know, saying that's how much bandwidth we have. Aren't we just moving the target, especially with DDoS? Absolutely. Yes. And, and again, it goes back to, you know, some of that is in the type of attack. Um, and some of that is in the assumption that you can just take over everything with pure bandwidth, but, uh, absolutely, uh, not a convincing argument. Super cool. Now you guys sent me this great press release about a report that you're cobbled together called the evolution of DDoS return of the hacktivist that was published in February of 2023. 
could you tell our listeners a little bit on how they can, you know, get access to that? And also, you know, what kinds of resources are you providing to help people learn about protecting themselves? Absolutely. So um, I want to be very clear that that was a joint effort. The financial services ISAC and Akamai got together. And so uh, the financial service ISAC represents all the banks across the world, banks, insurance companies, you know, wealth management, uh, traders. And so um, we went to, you know, what they're seeing hacking into the, the banks or attacking the banks, what we're seeing across our platform. And, and we wanted to collaborate and we want to say, first of all, what, do, what are we seeing for the threat? So you can go educate your leadership on, on what are the most common things we're seeing on the threat. And these are examples like, um, you know, since the war in the Ukraine kicked off, we've basically seen, you know, and these are, these are not accurate numbers, uh, but the, the numbers in, in Europe and the U.S., let's say it was 70-30, and they almost flipped in, in where the DDoS attacks were happening. Um, and so, you know, those kind of trends, then you can go back and talk to your leadership about if you're, if you're in Europe, you can go back and say, hey, listen, we need to relook at our risk posture. But if you go to FS ISAC's website or Akamai's website and look for that, you know, return of the hackabist, you'll see it. And that's where we talk about that, those Killnet kind of organizations who have a different business model, which, you know, it was, we want to want to do that extortion. Uh, and right now, it's interesting. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time talking about the the triple extortion threat, ransomware, exfil data being you know sold if you don't pay me, and uh, DDoS if you don't pay me. Um, and and of course we know that those are are probably the three we see in the press the most. Uh, we also know that if you want to be a, a profitable hacker, probably business email compromise is still the most profitable uh, threat methodology. Uh, but, but we picked the one for DDoS, and we really wanted to educate that. And then the last part of the report is how to mitigate, how to think about this. You know, your playbooks, your crisis management plan, how to, how to upstream do the protections and the exercises. Steve, I want to drill in a little bit on a couple of the things you said when you were talking about DDoS attacks. Uh, one of them being the very rapid ramp up of a volumetric attack. Have we passed the point at which it is absolutely required that companies have some sort of automated response in place? for DDoS attacks? I mean, have, have we left human response times uh, in the dim recesses of history at this point? So ultimately, our job is to prevent material impact to the business, to make sure we don't impact profit. And so that is a question that we have to answer in conjunction with our CFO. And so if the CFO says our website can be offline for half hour and I'm okay with that, then you can have a human in the loop. If you're in a heavily regulated industry, if you're in healthcare where safety's on the line, uh, absolutely. I think that, you know, we are at the point where you can't turn on your DDoS protections. They have to be always on. Well, you know, that, that gets me to the next one. One of the things we're hearing a lot about in cybersecurity is the deployment of artificial intelligence. And we're going to use that as the single term that hits AI, ML, deep learning, you know, the whole array. To what extent do you see machine intelligence being useful as a technology in response to things like DDoS attacks, which for some organizations can be very sharp and transient, you know, just long enough to keep them from accepting orders at the opening of a big sale or something like that. So a lot of this goes, I think, back to what environment we're in, you know, and so I think uh, ML uh, is, is an appropriate for 
your layer seven attacks, your request per seconds, um, where you're trying to interpret, is this authentic traffic? Um, you know, there's more likely to mimic, uh, it's not a UDP flood or a SIN flood. It's something, you know, more interesting. The complexity of the attack has changed. So in 2010, 90% of the attack methodology were from five techniques. Now, those five techniques represent just over half of the attacks. So half of the attacks are this matrix of these different techniques. And so for you to have something to recognize which is an attack, which I should black hole, which I should allow through, um, yeah, I think that is becoming more and more necessary. Well, you partially answered my my next question with what you just said, but I'd, I'd like to get a little more because when people think of DDoS attacks, they tend to think of a purely packet flood, something that chokes a network pipe. But, you know, there can be things that do, in fact, choke a network pipe. They can be connection floods. There can be, you know, ARP floods there can be things that try to choke out your server with, with service requests rather than network are there patterns or as you said are attackers now using all of these in combination to really attack an organization in full um so <laughs> we have a range um you know we were talking earlier about uh, some of our employees can uh, do things that challenge us, uh, make decisions that, you know, just that momentary lapse in judgment. And so again, um, I've got a case of a very sophisticated hacker coming after one of our European customers for an extended period, weeks, um, multiple times, and a very iterative, sophisticated battle, trying a technique, coming back, trying a different technique. And so that's one end of the spectrum. And then I've got, you know, somebody go rent a botnet and throw junk on the wall at the other end. And so uh, I, it really is that spectrum of uh, things out there. And then every you know, day we wake up and, and then what did somebody invent? Uh, so IOT is really the bane of our existence. So IOT is providing so much of this to attack with. And then you get somebody come up with the, you know, the phone home DDoS uh, flexion attack, where it's, you know, billion to one, like four billion to one. You got the middle bot reflection. Um, and so there's this brand new technique, which I don't want to call it a zero day, but but at a layman's term, almost a zero day technique that is changing the paradigms of what we're dealing with. So yeah, it is that constant battle. Steve, it's amazing how time flies when you're having fun. Lots of great stuff here. Thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, we're running a little low on time. So I wanna give you the chance to tell the folks at home where they can learn more about Akamai and all the wealth of services they have to offer. Yeah, I would encourage people to come to Akamai Look up our security blogs. We've got some great features in there. Uh, come down, load the report, the evolution of DDoS, uh, the rise of the hackivist, and uh, feel free to reach out and uh, look at uh, any of our capabilities. Thank you. Thanks again, Steve. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best thing enterprise and pod IT podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher. To Twy. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my amazing co host right here. Starting with our very own Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on for you in the coming week? Where can people find you? Well, actually, um, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I'm actually going to be manning the Maker FX booth at the Orlando Science Center. Um, they're running a STEM fair, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the pods project. It was a research project I did for DARPA on creating one of the first self-organizing, self-healing wireless networks. Um, we happened to partner with the MIT Media Lab and the result was Zigbee. So we're going to be talking about that. I've got all my slides from the deployment at Volcano National Park. Ought to be fun. Now, 
if you want to throw some ideas at me, probably the best way is still on Twitter. I'm ADV, N-E-T, L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. You're also more than welcome to throw an email at me. I'm Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T, at twit.tv. Or you could also hit me and the rest of the hosts at twiet at twit.tv. We'd love to hear from you. And it doesn't matter if, you know, your English isn't, you know, your strong point, as long as you're willing to let us use machine translators. So caveat there. Would love to hear from you. Would love to hear your ideas for shows. Um, if you want to ask us questions, go right ahead. Thanks and stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Cheaper. Well, we also have to thank everyone, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what about you? What's coming up for you in the coming week? Where can people find you? I'm uh, going to be heads down writing a bunch of stuff. I'm also going to be spending a little bit of time at that STEM fair uh, alongside my friend Brian uh, as we try to uh, let people know what's going on with STEM education in Central Florida. Um, if you want to keep up with me, I can recommend uh, Twitter. I'm at KG4GWA. Mastodon, I'm at KG4GWA at mastodon.sdr.org uh i'm on linkedin i'm on facebook i'm just uh pretty much everywhere but tiktok haven't been able to uh get into doing that yet so uh and i think the window is closing on new opportunities on tiktok so uh you know look for me and like i said if you're going to be at either rsa or enterprise connect in orlando Look, look me up. I would love to have a chance to meet you in real space. Thank you, Curtis. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash Twiet, that you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co host information, of course, the guest information, and also the links of the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version or your video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe and support the show. Now, you may have also heard of Club Twit. It's a members-only ad-free podcast service with that bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. It's only seven dollars a month, so there's a lot of great things about Club Twit. But one of them, one of them is actually the exclusive access to the members-only Discord server. Now I'm on it right now. It's a lot of great conversations going on in there. You can chat with hosts, producers. There's lots of separate discussion channels. Plus, they have some awesome special events as well. So lots of fun stuff. Join Club Twit and be part of that movement. Go to twit.tv slash club twit now club twit also offers corporate group plans as well it's a great way to give your team access to our ad free tech podcast the plans start with five members at a discounted rate of six dollars each per month and you can add as many seats as you like there and this is really a great way for your it departments your developers your sales teams your tech teams to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts and just like that regular membership they can join the twit discord server and get that twit plus bonus feed as well. So twit.tv slash club twit. Now, after you subscribe, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twiat because we talk about a ton of fun tech topics on the show and I guarantee they will find them fun and interesting as well. So definitely have them subscribe and join the party. Now, if you've already subscribed and you're available on these days, Friday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do the show live. You go to live that twit.tv there you can choose from any one of our streams there you can come see the behind the scenes come see how the pizza's made come see all the fun stuff that we do before and after the show so definitely come and join the the live stream and if you're going to join the live stream you might as well jump into our irc channel as well at irc.twit.tv we love our chat room just go to that website right now you can jump right into the twit live channel there we have a lot of great chat channels uh in there but also a lot of great characters in the twit live channel there they give us some amazing topics some questions great show titles are doing that right now so thank you guys for being here and being part of the live show definitely hit me up 
twitter.com slash luomm. There I post all my enterprise tidbits, direct message me, send me show ideas, have topics about careers, whatever you want to do. You can also hit me up at linkedin.com slash Louis Maresca. There I have lots of great conversations about people, uh, you know, who are starting in their career, who are in the middle of their career, who are looking to get into a particular part of their career. So definitely hit me up there as well, even for show ideas. If you want to know what I actually do during my normal work week at Microsoft, you can always check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. We, there we, we post all the latest and greatest ways for you to make and make your office solutions more productive for you by developing our solutions, whether it's recording macros with our newest latest and greatest office scripts, which is cross-platform, or it's using the traditional web add-in model, which is just you know really a great model for you building add-ins and uh, audit solutions for whether it's Outlook or Excel or Word or PowerPoint. So definitely check that out and make your office more productive for you. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Weekend Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all their support over the years. Thanks to all the engineers and staff at Twit. And also I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi just one more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the bookings for the show and the plannings for the show, and we really couldn't do the show without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support over the years. Now, before we sign out, I want to thank our editor because of course they make us look good after we record here because we make a lot of mistakes. At least I make a lot of mistakes. They, they kind of edited them all out. So thank you for all that. Of course, our TD for today, he's the talented Mr. Ant Pruitt. He, and he does an amazing show called Hands On Photography here on Twit, which I watch each and every week religiously. Ant, what's going on this week in the show? Because I can't wait. Well, thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, this week on the show, I decided to take a look at just doing some selective adjustments in photography. So like if you have a, a shoe that a client wanted you to take a photo of, but they decided their color was wrong, well, let's just change the color pretty easily inside of Photoshop and not change the color of everything else. So head on over to twit.tv slash hop and you'll see how. Now, yes, on the screen, it looks like a big blob of paint, but Trust me, watch it all the way through. It's going to be daggone beautiful. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much, Ant. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, I know you're super busy, so I won't keep you long, but I wanted to tell you about a show here on the Twit Network called Tech News Weekly. You are a busy person, and uh, during your week, you may want to learn about all the tech news that's fit to, well, say, not print, here on Twit. It's Tech News Weekly. Uh, me, Micah Sargent, my co-host, Jason Howell, we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news, and we love the opportunity to get to share those stories with you and let the people who wrote them or broke them share them as well. So I hope you check it out every Thursday right here on Twit. Twit.